Today is another teardown day. This time, the Framework 60 Watt Laptop Power Adapter. This adapter has a bunch of safety listings, so unlike a lot of the things I tear down, we're going to be looking for signs of doing things correctly and how things were implemented in this design that set it apart from less safe designs. This is a gallium nitride device, so we can try to see if there's any detail on that inside. I have a feeling like we won't see much there. I looked over this adapter in a previous video for its performance and identified that maybe it's over-engineered. I will do an analysis of the input stage and see if it's true or if it's right on target. The transformer will also be getting torn to bits as well. In this teardown series, I like to open up electronic devices to find out what makes them work and what is inside. The videos get technical, so hang on and always ask questions if you don't understand something. The components will be identified and analyzed as well as some of the safety aspects. If you want to help out the channel, see the links on my webpage or in the description. Patreon is now live as well as the super button. Thanks to my current patrons and channel supporters. This is going to be difficult to open up, isn't it? I can feel the glue magically multiplying inside the case as I attempt to open it. I am definitely going to stab myself this time. So, as usual, the pliers crack the case and it essentially opens right up. In this case, yep, glue doom. So, before digging out the components, let's take a look at the power performance we saw for this adapter. It has great efficiency for real power usage, and that was the main theme. In terms of comparisons with others, it sits at the top of that metric. The full video will be linked down in the description. This adapter is glue city. One side did pop off fairly easy, but getting the rest of the adapter out took some work. A little bit of back and forth and it is finally free, and I'm seeing some things I like inside of this power adapter. The circuit board was a little more difficult to remove because the case of this adapter is being used as part of the separation of voltages. So power adapters are doing two things. One is converting power into something your device can use, and the other is providing isolation between the dangerous mains electricity and the side you're going to end up touching. The better this isolation, the less the chances of being juiced. No one wants to be juiced. The little plastic insert here helps keep those two bits away from each other. The input connector has three wires, heat trunk and sent over to the main circuit board. These are also heat shrunk on the other side and it looks like the earth wire even has a small ferrite bead on it for some extra filtering anything to take the edge off. The metal shields on this adapter have some attention to detail that is important from a safety aspect. The bottom shield has a tape covering for the whole thing, then it has a bit of plastic shield over the whole thing in addition to that, providing two layers of insulation between the two sides of the power supply. The top shield is also taped, but doesn't come into physical contact with anything except the capacitors or potentially the wiring, so no connection to the secondary side. After taking the tape and metal shields off, we get a look at what is going on inside this adapter. Well, at least a look at lots of glue. Please hold while I deglue this thing. So much scraping. I just need to get the glue off to get an idea of the components and the layout. So it looks like there's one big chip on the bottom of this device and that integrates a lot of the power supply functionality into one black box. The components around that have plenty of separation though. The big things that matter here are creepage, which is the distance on the circuit board between the components and the clearance, which is the airspace between components. Creepage and isolation are two important parts of obtaining a safety listing and oftentimes why cheaper and more compact adapters don't have a safety label. The spaces in air and on the circuit board at least are all quite good. This device has a fuse on the input AC connection. The fuse is rated 3.15 amps. This is a standard feature and non-resettable, so once this pops, the adapter will not function. This is a high enough value though that if this fuse pops, then the major failure has occurred. The next thing the AC line connects to is a common mode inductor, then a capacitor, in this case 0.1 microfarads, X2 class capacitor with safety ratings. Then there's another common mode inductor, followed by the full bridge rectifier. The components before the rectifier work together to help keep the conducted radio interference under control. They don't do much for the power performance. The bridge rectifier is a part that converts AC, mains electricity, to DC pulses that can be further converted into voltage you need. This has the markings of LT1B29, which comes up with nothing on Google, but it is a normal silicon diode bridge. This component is one source of heat inside any power adapter. I have a feeling like none of these chips are going to have data sheets publicly available. Next are the main bulk capacitors. These store the DC pulses from the bridge rectifier to provide a relatively stable voltage to the switching part of the power supply. These are often the failure mode of power supplies because they dry out when they get hot 
and they get hot in small power supplies like this. It would be nice to see a premium brand capacitor, but no such luck here. They are 105 degrees C rated and 27 microfarads each. Four total with an inductor between them. The main chip in this device is a power integrations device. This incorporates a gallium nitride transistor and all of the control circuitry for both the mains voltage side and the output voltage side, as well as all the circuitry to communicate between them. This is a highly integrated device that is impressively small. I have seen this before in an earlier tear down, but this device doesn't have any marking on it I can find online. So this is either a custom chip or just labeled for this particular manufacturer. So unfortunately, there is no data sheet, so I don't know the exact operating parameters. I am speculating it is an InnoSwitch 3 of some variety. This is a flyback converter chip which is exactly what kind of power supply this is. There is a control chip for the USB side, again, no data, and there's also an output MOSFET. The output connects to a normal USB-C socket to plug in whatever device you need to charge up, or power, up to 60 watts. The control and isolation in this device is all handled by the control chip, so no other connections are made on the circuit board. The EMI suppression capacitor across the transformer is a 470 picofarad capacitor, and it is covered with appropriate marks for safety. This capacitor is used to reduce high-frequency radio noise that comes out of the transformer and can interfere with other electronics. There are some little spikes across this capacitor on the circuit board to act as a spark gap, in this case 6.5 millimeters, which means a lot of kilovolts to make a spark here. It is different that they didn't remove the solder mask here. This device has an earth connection. This adds an additional class Y capacitor from the earth connection to the output low voltage side, as well as a one mega ohm resistor across that capacitor. This section allows some current to flow through the earth pin, but not enough to cause harm if there is a fault somewhere else in the electrical system. Another good attention to detail here. That is about it for what is in this thing. Unfortunately, less of a complete picture than I wanted. This device does have a lot of integration though, so that means less to see. This is a positive from a manufacturing point of view. Less components means lower cost. Side effect of that though is it might also last longer. Manufacturers might not want that, so they put in cheap capacitors. Speaking of capacitors, how many times have I said capacitors in this video? I need to get a counter or something. It's about to get worse. We're going to analyze capacitors. I built up the input side of this power supply in LTSPICE, a circuit simulator tool, to look at the bulk capacitance to see if there is enough, too much, or too little. The power integrations device has an under voltage condition of 50 volts, so the power supply needs to stay well above this to operate. The bulk capacitors are stock at 27 microfarads each, and there are four of them. When looking at a graph of the voltage on these capacitors, we can see that with 27 microfarads, the range is 144 to 168 volts. Pretty reasonable range and pretty close to ideal for this power supply. The question is, would it operate with 15 microfarads? And it looks like the voltage would change to 125 to 168 over the course of the input voltage change. This could be a little difficult to deal with, but it's well over the under voltage condition at least. The current will be slightly higher though, so moving the stress to different places. In this case, it looks like the input current from the mains to the power supply, the peak input current, does decrease with small capacitors. This matters because optimizing this can optimize power quality. Larger capacitors will last longer potentially though, since as they dry out, they will have a higher starting value. Basically, they take longer to fail since they started with more. Of course, Power Integrations makes a chip for this, but it was not used here. The basic situation is that the capacitance is designed for the low voltage condition and therefore is way oversized for the higher voltages, leading to very poor power quality on the main side. It is a negative trade-off in the design of this power supply that has solutions, many solutions, but this was done the way it has been done and will continue to be done. I fear change. It is the safe design and they went with a bit of an oversized value, but looking at performance over time, probably correct. Speaking of safe, let's focus in on the transformer, which on the outside appears okay because it has the extra sleeves on the output wires. Let's get it removed from the circuit board so we can take a closer look. The transformer is the main way the power gets moved through the circuit, so it is an easy path for dangerous electricity to come in contact with safe electricity. As isolation improves, the two paths are less likely to cross. This transformer forms a magnetic connection, in this case at relatively high frequency. A transformer has some basic parts, a primary, a secondary, an auxiliary winding, and a core. The primary is the mains connected size that will have the high voltage on it. The goal is to wind it as close as possible to the secondary, the output side, and not have them physically touch each other. The core transfers the energy and is usually the source of a lot of losses. 
When opening up this transformer, we find that it has a layer on the outside of copper tape. This is forming a shield around the outside of the transformer. This is to keep electrical noise and magnetic noise contained within the transformer rather than have it radiate out to surrounding devices. This is often omitted in cheaper devices. This also means that the capacitor we saw across the transformer can be smaller, which means less leakage current. After removing that layer, the transformer starts to reveal its secrets, first with a sense winding, then a primary winding, then the secondary winding, and then what appears to be two more primary windings or another part of the secondary. No idea. That's the issue with not having the datasheet on this particular power integrations chip. We don't know exactly what configuration this is using, but it is still a flyback converter. I don't know if it has some of the more advanced features like zero voltage switching or any resonant conditions. From a designer perspective though, you follow the datasheet and you get a working and tiny power adapter, which is impressive. When the secondary or output layer revealed itself, it was always at least two layers away from getting in contact with the primary or input side of the transformer. This is great. The extra layer of tape wound in the opposite direction is just an extra attention to detail that makes sure electricity can't jump from one side of this power supply to the other. Not easily, at least. Everything has a breakdown point. In this device, the transformer is very safe in appearance, and with all the compliance marks on the outside, I am sure this thing has seen plenty of abuse during safety tests. A welcome change to some of the others I have looked at. Okay, so a mid-tiered power adapter does things a little bit differently. It uses a power integration solution to do most of the heavy lifting. The input side capacitance is a little overrated, but not terribly so. So the lack of control for input capacitance means inrush current will be high and the performance on the 230 volts suffers because of the oversized capacitance. There are solutions to these issues, even from power integrations, but they are not implemented here. We found that a power supply perspective, it is a flyback topology converter and is actually a fairly simple device. The grounding for this device implemented several features, including a Y-class capacitor and a single one mega ohm resistor between the earth connection and the low voltage output side. This is actually better than most and provides some protection against faults and keeps the laptop voltage from floating high from the power supply leakage. The shielding in this device always has at least two layers of isolation or protection from a potential short circuit. This is great in a device so compact to have this much attention to detail. The case is even molded as part of the safety feature with the cutout in the circuit board. This is mechanically and electrically designed very well. Kudos to the engineers that worked on this. Next up was the transformer, and it is good. Copper shielding, always an extra layer of insulation between any potential contact points between primary and secondary. Exactly what you want to see in a transformer. So, after all that, it is refreshing to see things being done correctly in a power adapter. This one is certainly an example of how things can be small and achieve great power performance whilst not sacrificing any safety aspects. Can power performance be improved further? That will be a topic for another day. Thanks for watching. Next week, I will be continuing the short series on USB power delivery, getting into PPS. It might take more than one short. Does anyone stitch together shorts into a longer video? Check my website for upcoming videos. There's a schedule of release dates, although the immediate schedule is not filled in. I have many more of these adapters to get through, so many more videos in the future. Goodbye.